This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, the podcast that introduces you to the rich world of storytellers who share their personal journeys, creative processes, and the stories behind their stories, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and I'm thrilled to be part of your writing journey. If you're an aspiring writer, a literary enthusiast, or simply someone who believes in the transformative power of words, you've come to the right place. Every week, we'll pop the cork on the world of successful storytellers and give you a healthy pour of inspiration, insight, and empowerment. My mission is to help writers like you realize your full potential through the transformative and therapeutic power of writing. Whether you're just starting your literary voyage or looking to refine your craft, I'm here to provide you with the knowledge, inspiration, and encouragement you need to embark on your own storytelling adventure. So, are you ready to uncork your story and let your creativity flow? Uncorking a story is about to begin. Sit back, relax, and let the transformative magic of storytelling whisk you away. Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Well, hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Uncorking a Story. I'm Mike Carlin, and I'm so happy to have you join me as I uncork Carrie Reichert's story. I want to remind you to please follow Uncorking a Story on all social media platforms, including Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter. You can find us at Uncorking a Story on all of those platforms. I also want to invite you to subscribe to us on YouTube, which has been a great growth vehicle for the show. It also gives me a great way to interact with the audience, gives the audience a great way to interact with each other. And also subscribers get early access to episodes and uh, they're also ad free. So I encourage you to please subscribe to our YouTube channel by going to YouTube and searching for Uncorking a Story and hitting subscribe. For you audio listeners out there, please subscribe, rate, and review Uncorking a Story wherever you get your podcast. Now, today's guest, Carrie Reichert, has an amazing story about a life-changing car accident, which almost cost her her life. Looking back on it, though, she chooses to view it as a blessing, which is really hard to believe when you hear just how bad this accident was. But she truly believes this accident happened for her and not to her. And that's a very important distinction, things happening for you and not to you. You know, traumatic events and even sort of non-traumatic events or just like mildly disappointing events can, can often help us course correct our lives. But I know it's those bigger traumatic events that, that can really push us in, in an opposite direction versus, you know, where our lives are heading. I want to share a story about uh, my late brother, Gregory, um, who was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer back in August of 2020. He, he passed away this past June of 2023. You know, when he got the news, he knew that his time was limited, you know, and it was really a shock because he was not a smoker. Uh, he led a very healthy lifestyle. He exercised regularly. He ate very cleanly. You know, he didn't, you know, abuse any, uh, any substances. He didn't abuse his body. You know, he was, he was like the picture of health. And, and if, if it could happen to him, my goodness, you know, it could happen to anybody um, that we can talk about uh, <laughs> my my belief that cancer is a stupid jerk um, on another episode. But uh, when he did get that news, um, that shocking news, he knew that his time was limited. And the big question he had to ask himself was, how was he going to spend the rest of his time? You know, like he immediately turned over the day to day operations of his retail store over to one of his managers. And, you know, when I asked him about that, because he wasn't feeling sick at the time, you know, his, the treatment he was on uh, was working pretty well. And he told me, you know, he said, Michael, even though I'm feeling good, and he was pointing at his, his two children, his girls, Emma and Elizabeth. He said, I want to spend the remaining time that I have left with them. And that, that hit me. I mean, he, he, this man was in the store seven days a week, you know, opening it up very early, always staying very late. You know, he poured his, his heart and soul into that business, you know, for, for over two decades. You know, I think the store opened in 1992 or 93. I can't remember. It was, it was the fall of 92 or 93. And uh, here, here we are in, you know, 2023. It's almost 30 years, right? 30 years. And, um, you know, he, he knew that that store and that success to that store would, would be part of his legacy. 
But as he was facing, you know, the biggest fight of his life, he knew that there was a much more important legacy uh, in front of him, which were his girls, Emma and Elizabeth. And in the three years that followed, you know, th there was really there were very few days he, he went without seeing them. It was really only at the very end when he was in, in the hospital for extended periods of time where where he didn't see his his children. And, um, you know, it was uh, he knew what was truly important to him, you know, and, and it was really revealed when he knew that his time was limited. You know, I like to say the obvious is not always apparent. You know, of course, you know, our children, our families are important to us, but we often take them for granted sometimes, don't we? And, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily apparent to him until the thought crossed his mind that he wasn't going to be around here forever and that his time was really going to be cut short. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to reference the title of my guest today, her book, uh, Carrie Rickard's book is, is named Trauma is a Catalyst. Well, trauma is a catalyst for making important changes in our lives. You know, there's no escaping pain in life. We are all human beings. We will all find and, and pain will find us. Trauma and disappointment will find us. We have no control over it. You know, we really don't. But what we do have control over is how we're, we react to those events. You know, if we can look at the negative things that happen in our lives and, and pardon me, try to find the lessons that they teach, we will become better people for it. You know, for Carrie, it was to slow down. You know, because you'll hear her talk about, it. you know, she says her life was was kind of careening out of control. She was working a ton. Her marriage, you know, was falling apart. She was in the middle of a divorce when her accident happened. Um, she she says that, you know, her life was out of control. And this accident kind of taught her to slow down. For my brother, you know, it was um, spending more time with his family and, and finding the beauty and wonder in really simple things. You know, my sister-in-law tells me that he he just became, you know, um, he was always into nature, but he would just spend hours outside in his yard, just like waiting for for birds to come and feed at his bird feeders. He loved hummingbirds like that was his that was the most exciting um, thing for him. <laughs> you know, some days was just seeing a hummingbird come, come into his yard. Um, so that's today's tip. You know, I, I hope I didn't bring anybody down. Um, really, the message there is is a beautiful one. Um, you know, to try to try and find the silver lining in life struggles. Um, I know it's cliched. I know. Pardon me, it's cliched. As writers, we have to avoid cliches. But but this is this is a big one. You know, try to find that silver lining in life struggles and disappointments. And um, that was the uh, the timer, by the way. In case anybody's wondering, that was the timer. I'm uh, I'm making wings as I record this. Uh, we're getting ready for the, uh, the championship series games uh, for, for the NFL. So uh, my friend Angelo is very happy that I'm making wings. But uh, to get back to the main lesson of this conversation, <laughs> you know, try to see the the uh, curveballs um, that life throws at you as coming at you for a reason. You know, they're they're not there to hurt you, like um, like Ray Hogan's you know curveball <laughs> hurt me in Little League. <laughs> You know, when I was like in grammar school, man, I, I did I did not see it coming. I guess that's a definition of a curveball, right? You, you kind of can't anticipate where it's going to be. Hit me right in the hip. And I was black and blue for a while. But but these curveballs aren't coming at you, you know, to hurt you. Um, they're coming at you to teach you something, you know, to guide you and maybe even point you into another direction that you should be heading. So uh, I hope you enjoyed listening to this conversation with Carrie Reichert as much as I enjoyed holding it. And now, without any further ado, let's uncork Carrie's story. Carrie Rickert's life-threatening accident and related complications started her down a path of examining what was, what is, and what could be. Hers is a story of hope, of possibility, and of embracing the fight to become something new. She joins me today on Uncorking a Story to talk about her life and latest book, Trauma is a Catalyst. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, Carrie. Thanks so much, Mike. I'm so glad to be here. I'm happy to have you here, Carrie. And I'm curious, where does your story as an author begin? So I would say that where it really began was right after I got home from the hospital um, from my accident um, it, that I talk about in my book. 
I was having a lot of trouble kind of processing what was going on with me and how my life had changed. And I found that writing really was the way for me to process. All right. Well, but before we get into the book, then. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no. Go ahead. No, I, I, I was hoping mm-hmm. maybe you can give us a little bit more of a backstory as to as to the accident and what happened. Sure, absolutely. So, um, I, to to kind of give you a, a an even little bit further back, um, I would say that my um, my life was kind of careening out of control, um, which seems appropriate for having been in a car accident but um you know like nothing was really working well I had two kids uh, at home I was separating in the process of separating from my husband of 10 years um finding a place to live not feeling like I was doing well at work like everything just was like crashing down around me um and then I was um, you know, I was at work one day, and we were moving offices. So we were going from one office to another, and we were packing things up in the office. And, um, and then we were supposed to go to an activity afterward to kind of like celebrate the move and all this stuff. Well, my colleague um, Emily and I went in my car, and um, it was raining really hard. Um, it uh, and I ended up hydroplaning into the back of a tractor trailer um, off of Interstate ninety five, exiting onto one hundred. So they were unable to fly me to University of Maryland Shark Trauma um, because of the weather, um, and it took them about a half an hour to get me out of the car. Uh, but once they did, they took both Emily and I to shock trauma, and I ended up staying there for four weeks before I went on to rehab for another couple of weeks. Oh so it's been quite a journey. <laughs> what What do you remember, if anything, of of the accident? I mean, I know that you know when when I've talked to the people before, they say you know that the mind has this great ability to like block out pain in that moment. But what, what was it like for you? Honestly, I only remember a couple of things from the day. Um, I remember riding down the elevator with Emily. I remember talking about how I needed to get an oil change. And while I was driving, she was looking up Jiffy Loops so that I could get my car's oil changed. It turns out I didn't need to get my car's oil <laughs> oil changed. I totaled it. Um, but uh, so those are the only things that I remember previous to the accident. I don't remember the accident at all. I don't remember immediate aftermath. Emily remembers some. She will. She says that I was in and out of consciousness. Um, and but I remember waking up at shock trauma and not being afraid. I was like, oh, OK, this is where I'm supposed to be right now. It was this like weird calm. You know, you would think like you wake up in the hospital and it's like, oh, my God, what am I doing here? What happened? And I was like, oh, OK, this makes sense. This is where I should be. Um. I would say my family did not feel the same way. <laughs> I, I'm sure, you know, while, while the time may have felt a little bit faster to you, uh, I'm sure it was very slow for your family. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. They, um, I was so, so very blessed. Um, my mom is a former emergency room and ICU nurse. She did rehab for many, many years. And so she was the perfect advocate for me. She, um, she knew what to ask. She knew the, you know, medical jargon. She knew, um, 
everything that was going on. And I think that was probably both good and bad for her. Like she knew, and maybe she knew too much because she knew to be very afraid. Um, I did not have a very good prognosis. Um, You know, I had some very severe injuries, including a traumatic brain injury. Yeah, I can imagine with your mother's, you know, experience and background, like there's a curse to that knowledge, right? I, I always call that the curse of knowledge. You Absolutely. Know, yeah. Um, so what was what was recovery like for you in those four weeks? And I'm sure the recovery was a lot more than four weeks, but that four weeks in the hospital, what was that like? It was. So the first four weeks at Shock Trauma, it was um, a lot of surgeries. I had to have my hand completely rebuilt. I had multiple life-saving surgeries. I ended up um, having a clot in my left carotid and having to get four stents in it. I developed an aneurysm near my brain stem. So like I had all of these things happening. And, you know, once I got stable, I was doing physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. I had also um, paralyzed my vocal cords on the left side. And so I um, had to learn how to swallow again. Um, You know, I had a food tube, like it was a mess. Um, And but the things that I remember about shock trauma is that I one, it didn't, I, it never occurred to me that I wasn't going to be fine. I think it occurred to everybody else that I might not be, but I was like, nope, nope, we're good. I'm, I'm just going to get through this and we're going to do everything that we can. And I'm going to be back to normal. Um, that's, you know, normal is, is relative and depends on perspective. Right. Um, but, and that was part of the things that I had to to process after I got home. But, um, you know, I worked so hard in my therapies and a lot of the therapists would like just keep coming back to, to my room to, to work with me because I was so interested in working. And I remember asking my mom, I'm like, I don't understand why they're so excited to work with me. Like, you know, I'm just working on this. Like they're doing their job. I'm doing my job. My mom said, most brain injury patients do not actually, like it it is hard to get brain injury patients to focus on rehab because it feels like, it, it feels like such a difficult thing to overcome. And in a lot of ways, I was really lucky. I, you know, I lost a few words here and there, but for the most part, I remembered things. I, you know, could communicate well. I did great on all the testing. Like, I was a shock to most people. Yeah. You know, so, just thinking, thinking about your, your just sort of your attitude there when you knew what, what you know, you, you mentioned like not really having a sense that, you know, it wouldn't be all right. And I'm curious, where, where did that confidence, yeah. where do you suppose that confidence came from? Was that just like a belief that, hey, it's got to be OK because I've got to be OK? Or was it more was there something greater at play inside you at that point in time? Um. Honestly, I think I have sort of always looked at life that way. Like, I will figure this out. Like, I, and this is not to say that I don't recognize that there are things that are a lot of hard work, right? And certainly rehabilitation after a brain injury and all of the surgeries I had, that was a lot of hard work. Um but I have always known somewhere in me that I would figure out a way to be okay. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that it's gonna, that, that that outcome is gonna match the picture that I have in my head, but it could, or it'll be something. And that something will 
be fine. I'll figure it out. Um, so I've always had this, I've, I'll figure it out kind of way. I think also I had two little kids. My kids were eight and four when my accident happened. Um, and like I said, I had just separated from my ex-husband. We were just figuring out like living in the kids living in two different houses. It was this whole, you know, whole thing. I'm like, I knew those kids needed me and, and I needed them. So I'm like, eh, I'll figure it out. <laughs> and so I did. Yeah. How, how close to death were you? Oh, um, so I don't know. Um, now my surgery for my aneurysm took significantly longer than they thought it would. Um, so I was under radiation for longer, like as long as you possibly can be. So they like just were able to get it, um, to, to break it up. Um, before I had to come out of surgery because of the radiation. But I remember my doctor, um, Dr. Jindal, who, you know, I think saved my life on multiple occasions. He, um, he came into my room right before that surgery. And he said, you know, Carrie, I just want to make sure that you understand the risks involved with this surgery. He said, there's a really high chance that you're going to have a stroke and you will never be the same. You may be in a vegetative state. And I said to him, okay, so what are the risks if I don't do the surgery? And he said, oh, you'll die. And I said, then I guess we're going to do the surgery and I am going to have faith in your abilities. <laughs> He did it. <laughs> and here you are. Here I am. So, you know, I think many people would say I came very close to death. I, like I said, never occurred to me that I would die. Yeah. Did you, um, because I've talked to people who have been in similar situations. Did, did you have a near death experience at all during that time that you recall or? No. Nope. I don't, I know that's kind of boring, right? Like, I'm like, gosh, a near death experience. If, if I almost die, I should have one of those experiences, right? I did not. Yeah. <laughs> so, what? and maybe that's because I didn't believe I was going to. So, you know, who knows? Fair enough. Well, let's talk about the book. Um, I, I'm curious to know more about sure. it. So the, the book is called Trauma is a Catalyst. Um, what can you share with us about the book? Yes. Sure, absolutely. Um, so trauma is a catalyst. Um, it, just the title of it is, um, you know, my experience provoked significant change in my life. And I wanted the title of the book to really magnify that. Um, the book itself is in three different sections. Uh, the first section is actually my mom's journal entries from the from when I was in the hospital. So, like from the first accident, uh, for, you know, from the accident all the way through when I got home from rehab, when I was able to come home, and um, you know, I think writing for her was as cathartic as it was for me later. Um, and I remember reading those entries. I've only read them twice. So like once, not long after I got home and I just remember reading it and just sobbing and sobbing and like, wow, I didn't realize that everything that was happening with me impacted my family in such a way. Cause you're, you know, you're very, insular in those moments right you're you're kind of in your own little bubble and you're like all right i've got to focus on me only and it's not that you don't really know but you like that's not the focus because i had to get better that was the focus 
Um, so that's the first part of the book. The second part of the book, I had started writing a blog soon after I had gotten home from the hospital. And like I said, that was really my way of processing, um, you know, the changes that I went through, the changes I was going through, how I was incorporating the things that I was learning. Um, so I wrote that blog for, gosh, three plus years. Um, and so the second part of that book is really that blog there. I mean, obviously some of the things aren't in there, but, um, you know, that, that was the beginning part of my journey, um, post acute. And then the last part is, is kind of now where I am now. Um, what I have learned from all of this, what things are still, you know, that I still have to accommodate for, um, how it has changed, how I do my life, right? And mostly it, I think the theme throughout it is that I can make whatever it is work. And I haven't just made whatever it is work. I've made it work very well for me. It is not at all. My life is not at all how I thought it would be. It's not, it does not match the picture in my head. But it's better. And so I am grateful. Like I, I, my accident was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me. It was really hard and really horrible at the time. But if I hadn't had that accident, I wouldn't be who I am now. And I like me. So I, I know, uh, you know, a lot of people who have been through you know, a lot of challenging times, um, you know, sometimes come to this very healthy adult you know, perception or belief that, you know, this thing or th this series of things didn't happen to me. It happened for me. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hearing you say, you know, something similar. Um, wh what are the biggest changes in your life that, that you've recognized stemming from, you know, the, the experiences from that accident? Sure. Um, so I would say one of the biggest things was that I had to completely shift my perspective on what work looked like for me um, because I was working for a management consulting firm in Baltimore. I was commuting from Ken Island, so an hour each way. I was working, you know, 70 hours a week. I loved working. Um, you know, I... I would leave super early, get home in time to pick up the kids, get the kids all situated, and then go back to work. Or like I would just like sit down at my computer and work some more. Um, after the accident, I realized that I could not keep that pace anymore, that that pace was not healthy for me. Um, that pace is probably not healthy for anybody, but um, it was especially not healthy for me um, at the moment. And it wasn't healthy for my kids because, you know, what that, like, if I overdid it, um, and when you've had a brain injury, there's a, it's, there's a thing called neuro fatigue. Um, and, and, you know, you, other people have probably experienced it is that feeling like, oh my God, my brain is tired. Like I am so tired. It's at the brain level. Um, that happened to me, especially early on all the time. And I've never been a particularly good at resting kind of person. Like I just go. I go, I get the things done. I get, you know, like whatever, whatever we need to do, we're going to do and we're going to do it well. And, you know, and that's always been sort of my personality. And I have had to learn how to 
reconcile how I can do work now with also needing to rest and that I can be good at what I do and still rest as much as I need to in order to continue to be effective. Um, you know, so I left the management consulting firm that I worked for and then um, started my own business. And, you know, that has sustained me for 10 plus years now. Um, it It's not always a sure thing. Things go up and down, um, you know, but I've also had an opportunity to write a book. I've had an opportunity to work with my son um, because he does online school. So I've had an opportunity to help him through his school journey. He's a senior in high school this year. Um, you know, like there are opportunities that I would not have had if I had not had this accident. And if I had not learned how very important taking care of myself was, because they never actually believed that before. You know, it was like, eh, I'm fine, whatever. We'll just, I have a cold, whatever, we'll push through. I have the flu, it's fine. I've got this. I've got to take care of the kids. I've got to do all the things. And, you know, and now I meditate. I go to acupuncture once a week. I, um, you know, I, if I have a break in my day, I take a nap. And all of that is not making me less than, which is what my original perception was. If I do this resting thing, that's going to put me behind either in my work or behind somebody else or whatever. And it's, it doesn't, I, you know, like, Resting and taking care of myself and, and really paying attention to what my body is telling me has allowed me to, um, has really allowed me to thrive. Yeah, it's, it's like, you know, I almost want to say that, you know, oftentimes things happen in our lives and the universe sends us a message that we're doing something wrong, you know, that we need to. And little reminders come along the way, right? We need to spend more time on self-care. We need to remember right. to put to put our oxygen mask on first before putting on someone else's. It seems like a, a traumatic brain injury and a and a car accident in four weeks. That's a really big message. I mean, that's like the universe probably yeah. could have sent you a. I, a, I ignored a, a lot of them. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I ignored messages for years. Um, like I said, my life was careening out of control before that accident. So the best thing for me was to be forced into only taking care of myself. Mm. I had been trying to take care of everything else people's perceptions, my children's well-being, my home, like everything, right? And that accident forced me into stopping. I had to stop. I couldn't focus on anyone other than me. And I needed that to understand that if I want to be something for my children, right? If I want to be an active part of their lives, then I need to make sure that I'm okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a gift to them to take care of yourself. Yeah. When they when may not think so, but they're teenagers. <laughs> they'll, they'll come around at some point. Um, okay. You know, I'm curious when um, when when you started the writing process for this book and, and just the project itself, kind of putting it together. I know you had your mother's 
um, you know, your mother's writings, and then of course your own, um, you know, some of your blog posts, and then and then sort of present day kind of what your life is like. How how much of a part of the healing process was was writing this and putting this together? Oh my gosh, it was amazing. I, and it took me, so when I was writing the blog, I had had a lot of people say to me, oh, you should write a book, Carrie. And I'm like, I'm not going to write a book. Nobody's going to want to hear this, right? <laughs> like, no, like, who wants to read this? And yet people were reading my blog. So clearly, like, somebody wanted to read it. Um, and it took almost 10 years before I was like, okay, I'm ready to write the rest of this now. Um, and so going back through all of that again to like decide what I was going to include, decide what I, you know, like what I was going to leave out and really putting kind of putting a bow on it, if you will, like understanding like, okay, so all of these things and all of this growth over 10 years, how, how has this shaped me? So that last piece of the book is a really the like culmination of all the other stuff. Um, and so, yes, I would say that was a huge part of the healing journey for me. And I think that, you know, I had, shoved a lot of it away you know like i'm i'm not gonna i i've written this now like with the blog i've written this now i'm not gonna think about it anymore um and deciding that i was ready to write the rest of the book made me re-examine all of that right and and to really know what kind of impact that experience had on me and that in itself was incredibly healing. Yeah. You know, we, we hear the word trauma, and I think we're, we're so conditioned to believe that it's a bad thing, right? You know, trauma is something that we mm -hmm. have to recover from. But just hearing you talk, and of course, just looking at the name of your book, you know, trauma doesn't necessarily, I mean, of course, it, it signifies something negative, but it doesn't have to, the meaning behind it doesn't have to be negative. And that's, I, I'm, I'm right. feeling like I'm picking up all of that as, as, as you're talking to me. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, you know, I don't want anyone to think that it wasn't a horrible experience being in the hospital for six weeks, being away from my family, being in pain, having a food tube, you know, having pins and, and things in my hands and a neck brace and all kinds of stuff. None of that was fun. None of that was felt like a good thing. And still, I wouldn't give it back. Not one part of it. Um, because it it has been ultimately a positive thing in the journey of my life, um, you know. And I think that I do believe that we can look at all traumas that way. I mean, does it absolutely suck in in the here and now? For sure. Can we take that experience and learn and shift and grow from it? Absolutely. Um, and there's hope in that, right? Like so many people have traumatic experiences and don't have the sense of hope. And that is part of the reason why I wanted to write my book is that I wanted people to have a sense of hope that trauma can be a catalyst for something good. Um, you know, and so much of, you know, any trauma, it can be very isolating, right? Like, I mean, there are so many different kinds of traumas there. Everybody's story is a little bit different, right? So you always feel like, oh, I'm alone in this journey. Even if you have a good support system and people to help you, nobody quite gets what you're going through. 
But the more we talk about our experiences, the more we can we realize that other people have experienced some part of that journey. It may not be, oh, somebody got in a really bad car accident and ended up with a traumatic brain injury, right? It could be that somebody had, um, you know, had fell off a horse and, and broke their arm and weren't able to use their arm anymore. So it's still this like recovery and um, like rebuilding process that provides hope and gives people a sense of connection. Um, I'm curious, what, what can you share with us about your work at Nomis Advisors? Sure. Um, so Nomis Advisors is, so it's, I started off, um, as a management consultant, um, and I still do some business consulting. I, um, I also have, uh, started doing some, um, life coaching, um, working with trauma survivors to help them kind of mold that really terrible experience into something that's going to shift their life for the better. Um, and like I said, I believe that talking about, uh, about our experiences really helps remove that isolation and provides a set, can provide a sense of hope for people. Um, so that's, I, you know, I'm still doing management consulting and also I am doing this coaching because I'm, I am hoping to positively impact other people who have experienced trauma. Yeah. Just another sort of blessing coming out of, you know, this, this horrific event for you, it's, you know, the ability to help other people, um, regardless, I'm, I'm assuming regardless of what their traumas are, helping them lead to what I, what exactly. I've heard post-traumatic growth. Yes, exactly. Yep. And, and you're right. It doesn't matter what the trauma is. It doesn't have to be a, an accident. It can be absolutely anything because anything can be a catalyst for post-traumatic growth. There you have it. Well, Carrie, where can listeners find out more about you? Are you active on social media? Do you have a website you want to share with everybody? Sure. My website is nomisadvisors.com. That's N-O-M-I-S advisors.com. Um, I also have a, um, a speaker website, carryrickert.com. Um, and um, you can find my book and my podcast and all of that on my website. Um, and um, I'm on socials, Facebook, I, I Carrie Rickert, and Instagram at Nomis Advisors, and LinkedIn, Carrie Rickert. All right. I will be sure to put all of those uh, links in our show notes so people don't have to uh, struggle or, or scramble, I should say, to, to write them down. I'll also put some links to where people can buy Trauma is a Catalyst. But before I let you go, I've got two more questions. One of them is, how did you come up with the idea for the book cover? It looks like a work of art. It is a work of art. I am so glad you asked me about this because it is quite a story. Um, I, I promise I'll keep it brief though. Um, so my cousin is an artist. She is an amazing artist. And um, she, and I kept thinking, oh, I really want Rachel to do my book cover. I don't want to ask her because she's got so much going on. She was like in the process of, she lived in New York and now she lives in Joshua Tree. But for a year, she traveled across the country and painted in plein air. So I'm looking at her new works thinking, oh my God, this, like, something like this would be absolutely perfect for my book cover. But I don't want to, like, overdo it, right? I don't want to, like, ask her and make her feel bad, like, she has to do it. 
So we're at Christmas at, at my uncle's house, her, her dad's. And I was talking about the book and everything. And she says, Carrie, would it be all right if I drew up a couple of things, um, you know, and for your book cover? And, you know, if it doesn't work, it's fine. But like, I would be so honored if I could be a part of this with you. And I'm like, oh, that's exactly what I wanted. <laughs> I was so excited. So um, she she did the painting and she actually um, sent it to me um, not that long ago. And my parents got it framed for me for Christmas. So it's like framed in my office so I can see it every single day. And uh, it just, she captured so perfectly what I wanted in my book cover and I'm so grateful she's at rachelrickertart.com she's awesome well very cool and and my final question is um, if you could go back in time and whisper some words of advice into the younger Carrie's ear and, and I'm thinking here of course the Carrie pre-accident um, what would you tell your younger self if, if you could tell her anything? That it will still be okay, even if it doesn't match the picture in your head. You know, I, I think so many people have this ideal vision of what their life is supposed to look like. And most of us, our lives don't actually look like that. And some people lament that, right? Like, oh, you know, my life didn't turn out like I thought it was going to. That's that's kind of terrible, right? And I would just remind myself that it's not terrible. It's just different. And different is okay. Yeah. You know, I think about our children. I have three. They are uh, triplets. So they're about to turn 22. I can't believe I'm hearing myself say that wow. and I can't believe it. Um, but, you know, I grew up in a time where, you know, life was, um, I, I, you know, I'm going to sound like an old man, but it was a simpler time. Right. We had three, <laughs> we had three TV stations. Right. And, you know, plus cable. But you know, for the most part, three right. free TV stations didn't have cell phones, social media. And our, our kids are growing up in this world where right. they they look at their screens and they're seeing like an idea. Everyone ha is having these idealized lives, you know, whether it's on TikTok or mm -hmm. Instagram or whatever. And uh, and I realize I'm sounding older and older by the moment. But, you know, they I, I have to constantly <laughs> reflect, this is not this is not real life. You know, these people, and even in like my peer group, you know, I know adults who are not happy people, but they're, they're putting these images of their lives, you know, out there for other people to look at as if they're, they're, you know, leading these ideal lives. And that sets us right. up for, that sets us up for disappointment in many ways because our lives are not like that, you know? So, Absolutely. and, and, but you, you saying this, Hey, it's okay if your life doesn't turn out the way you thought it would, because how you thought it would was influenced by all of these things that were are really just impossible to, um, to achieve. Um, so I think that's, that's right. great advice to give your younger self. I love it. I will get off my Thanks. soapbox. I, <laughs> <laughs> I don't disagree with you. And yeah, like, the Apple IIe was fine, right? <laughs> I love the app. Hey, look, I wanted an Apple IIe. Actually, it was an Apple IIc. I wanted an Apple IIc. That's all I wanted. Christmas 1984. Maybe it was 85. I can't remember. It was pre-Mac. Uh -huh. I, I know it was yeah. pre-Mac. And my father comes home with an IBM PC, two five and a quarter inch disk drives, no hard drive. And I'm like, but I wanted an Apple. And that's, you know, that was fine though. It was fine. Yeah. Of course, of course, our cell phones, right. right, are have more power than that old Apple IIe or Apple IIc or oh, the least. For <laughs> sure. It's crazy, isn't it?
crazy. Well, thank yeah, you for so letting me be I'm a, right like, there with you, making myself sound old. <laughs> yeah, thank you for letting me not only sound old, but but get my real nerd on because I am a nerd about that stuff. Um, but uh, enough about me. We've been talking with Carrie Rickard. Carrie's book is Trauma is a Catalyst. You can buy it wherever books are sold. I, of course, will put some links to uh, to where uh, listeners can buy it in our show notes. So please check those out. Carrie, thank you so much for stopping by uncorking a story and letting me uncork yours. Thank you so much, Mike. This has been wonderful. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.